we appreciate that despite all the challenging situation that all of you must be facing brought to us by this pandemic uh, all of you are present here today because you know you're motivated to learn and keen on learning new things and i must congratulate you on that and i appreciate it um so uh, ashwini has already uh, mentioned uh, my uh, professional background um uh, to give a further brief introduction on what i uh, do uh, as a consultant at international trade center um i work as a consultant for the trade for sustainable development program where uh, my job essentially is to um, update maintain uh, the database on sustainability standards both environmental as well as uh, social sustainability standards and advising smes on market access conditions and um, mainstreaming sustainability across global value chains um so as you can tell that uh, environment and sustainability is definitely one of my favorite areas uh, within the uh, within the ambit of international trade regulation per se so i thought maybe i'll be a little greedy and add uh, one slide on that uh, just to bring it to your notice and attention uh so uh yes having set this background i i i think i mean it it's a shame that we have to do the session remotely and honestly i think it would have been great if i could meet you all in person but uh it also makes me think that uh it's incredible that despite all of the uh this all of these circumstances despite being miles apart and being in different time zones we are all connected today and with such ease because of 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 the uh, electronic devices right in front of all of us and um the internet connectivity which has enabled this so uh, of course we have uh, you know um, technological advancement to thank for but one shouldn't undermine the importance of international trade that has facilitated this and led to this development and rather facilitated the access to uh, technology uh, to different parts of the world today so uh, this is of course uh, not a very subtle segue into our topic of discussion today um uh, and uh, just as a general observation if if you start noticing things around you the more you will realize that international trade has been is as a part of our day to day life um uh, and that you will start noticing that different products that you use every day are actually manufactured assembled in different parts of the world and bought like brought at your doorstep and are at your beck and call um and all of this has been possible because of uh, the economic globalization right and um that it is definitely um uh, say a product of uh, liberalization of trade and foreign direct investment um uh, so uh, i think uh, wto framework uh, is would be an interesting topic to cover uh, for law students uh, given that it's it's not a part of the curriculum as i understand uh, in even in mumbai university or if you're from any other uh, law school i'm not sure if it is a part of your curriculum so um, the idea today uh, is that i would like to give you a brief introduction to uh, the wto framework and rather wto legal framework and the institutional structure in general and briefly touch upon the uh, trade linkages to environmental issues um so uh, uh before before i move on to my slides i would like to uh, just say that today's discussion i want to keep it a uh, high level concept based and not make it very technical or legally verbose uh because i i want to reach out to as many students I, as i can from different years of law school and try and not make this a boring discussion cuz i would like you to uh, i i would rather think that this presentation will be a success if at least five of you uh, pick up books to read about international trade regulation after the session so if your understanding of international trade regulation is advanced i like to apologize in advance and uh, i would also like to encourage you to write to me i, I would be uh, uh, you would see my email id later and you can get in touch with me and i would be happy to discuss any such technical topics that you would like to uh, 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 talk about uh, and discuss and i would love love to learn from you as well um so uh, having said that i will perhaps now like to uh, request ashwini to uh, display my slides if you can
I'm also having a look at the uh, chat box. Thank you very much for joining today. Um, uh, wow, and we have some uh, uh, professors as well that, no pressure. <laughs> no, but, but uh, that's great. Um, thank you, thank you for participating today. Is, okay. the, is the slideshow visible? Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, if you can just uh, move to the next slide, please. Great. So, uh, so in the first slide, as you can see, uh, I would like to begin uh, with addressing the questions of what is trade and uh, why is there a need to regulate it? Um, so, simply put, trade is a give and take, right? Um, let's take an example of an, an Indian farmer who, who sells, say, uh, an Indian farmer who produces rice, who sells this rice to a Swiss retailer. Uh, we would term it as exports. And on the other hand, there could be uh, an Indian chef who wants to say purchase um, Gruyere cheese from Switzerland or from a Swiss farmer to, I don't know, use in a cheese fondue or something. We would, we would call it import. So export and import are like the most basic concepts that uh, uh, one needs to understand to understand the larger scheme of international trade regulation. But uh, the, of course, the examples that I gave to you are very simplistic, right? They are of commodities, which essentially we would, in, uh, in terms of trade, call goods. Uh, but what happens, say, if one of you tomorrow goes to uh, Georgetown to pursue an LLM and you pay tuition fees in exchange for uh, education that you will receive, it isn't, there's nothing tangible in it, but that is trade as well, right? So uh, that, that is what we like to call uh, um, trade in services. So uh, basically what I'm trying to get at is uh, trade as a subject is as simple as we understand it to be. And it can be as complicated as the interconnectedness of uh, the global economy demands it to be. Uh, let's take a very cliched example of uh, iPhones. When, when we purchase an iPhone, it comes with uh, this particular uh, text which says that designed in California, assembled in China. And as, as we can see that the consumer can be based, say, in Bombay, in Bangalore, in Delhi, or in, or, or, or in Geneva, or in Bern. Um, uh, all of this has been made possible to us, because not just because of trade, but it is also interesting to see why businesses take this decision of sort of um, segregating or diversifying uh, their production on in, in like throughout various uh, markets throughout various countries before a product reach, uh, reaches your doorstep so what drives uh, business people to take these decisions there has to be some advantage right and uh, these often go in the favor of the argument of free trade which is uh, uh, which is based on um, the concept of uh, comparative advantage now what does that mean uh, economist David Ricardo uh, coined this term. What it basically means is that, say, if there's a country A, which is better than country B in producing computer chips, and then there is country B, which is better than country A in producing avocados, then um, perhaps both the countries will benefit if they specialize in, uh, uh, in, in producing computer chips and avocados respectively, and then trading these products. Um, uh, this is basically the argument that is used uh, in favor of uh, free trade. Um, so having said that, there are uh, certain countries that are richer than the others, right? So obviously there comes a question of whether uh, trade benefits everyone or does it benefit only certain countries? Do only specific countries gain from trade? Um, and uh, the next question that arises is that how can the, the, the benefits of international trade be felt equally and equitably in all economies? And uh, this, of course, has become a political issue time after time. There are governments who seek to, uh, you know, restrict international trade for various reasons, uh, like protecting domestic industries or, say, public health or human rights or even national security in, in some cases. Uh, so, given the complexities 
that are involved it becomes imperative and important to uh, have a rules based system um now when we say a rules based system what role does it play so as you can see on the slide the question is what role is the uh, what is the role of legal rules in international trade and uh, i have categorized it in like four uh, uh, sub topics firstly it is strain from adopting trade restrictive measures so as i said earlier governments sometimes are uh, also under immense pressure from various interest groups in the country right um the, the there has to therefore be a framework where the rules ensure that these short term national pressures uh, don't encourage governments to adopt disguised protectionism which goes against the obligations that uh, countries make under uh, the wto uh, uh, the, under the wto framework um so whereas um uh, governments may take trade restrictive measures it's important to understand whether or not they are disguised protectionism uh, so the uh, international rules on wto like rather wto law gives a better understanding of uh, uh, of whether uh, uh, these measures are trade restrictive for legitimate reasons or are they protectionist um and uh, the second point is that of security and predictability so as for the key stakeholders in this uh, conversation is a uh, uh, conversation are concerned it's not only the government but one of the major backbones is uh, are the businesses right are the traders uh, what encourages these traders to uh, engage in international trade and uh, one of the easiest answer would be is to is to have like is to ensure that they have a certain degree of security certainty and predictability uh, which helps them thrive in uh, being a part of the international trade uh, at large um which brings me to the third point and that is uh, protection and promotion of societal values and interests so um uh, i guess one of the uh, most important or rather controversial issues is uh, that that governments face is how do we ban uh, how how do we balance uh, uh, the expectations or obligations under uh, wto framework and at the same time ensure uh, that the national interests are safeguarded there could be various national interests such as uh, public health especially we can see in in case of covid crisis right uh there was a sudden demand for uh, medical equipments and ppes so how 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 can a member uh, how can a wto member ensure that their national interests are being safeguarded um there could be issues uh, relating to sustainable environment um uh, protection of consumer interests uh, minimum labor standards or even national interests for that matter um uh, uh, that are involved whereas wto ensures that this balance is somehow met uh, having a, a transparency having some kind of a transparency and harmonization in these rules uh, definitely help in uh, in sort of uh, ensuring this balance to be maintained and uh, lastly uh, greater equity in international economic relations um as i as i mentioned before um uh, there are various economies there are some some countries that are richer than the others how does one ensure uh, that same rules are applied to uh, equally and equitably to all countries or all wto members is by having a set of uh, specific rules having a rules based system so uh, these are essentially the um, uh, you know four major roles that uh, legal rules play in um in keeping with the international trade scenario um having said that uh, i have been harping so much on the uh, rule uh, on the on the role that legal rules play um uh, i will now move on to give like a brief introduction of what uh, the world trade organization is uh, can i request uh, you to please move to the next slide thank you um so as we all know world trade organization is an international organization that offers uh, um, a forum for negotiate uh, for uh, countries to negotiate agreements 
uh, to reduce obstacles to international trade and also uh, provides for a legal and institutional frameworks uh, framework which helps in monitoring the implementation of these negotiated agreements and of course it goes without saying that when, when there are a, a set of rules and there are multiple stakeholders there are multiple members uh, there they, there may arise disputes so if these disputes arise uh, there needs to be a mechanism in place to resolve these disputes and WTO uh, provides for the institutional framework uh, and set of rules whereby these disputes can be resolved. Um, uh, a, a little bit of trivia, uh, WTO consists of uh, 164 members which includes developing countries as well as uh, uh, customs territories um, in, in terms of the organizational structure. Uh, the highest institutional body uh, of WTO is the ministerial conference, which meets roughly uh, in two years. And in the interim, there is general council, which uh, uh, keeps running uh, the organization's business. Um, apart from uh, these institutional, uh, or rather uh, institutional bodies, there are various other specialized subsidiary uh, bodies, such as uh, different councils, committees, subcommittees, etc which all uh, uh, help in administering, monitoring, and implementation of the various WTO agreements. Um, okay, so having, thank you so much. Uh, having established uh, what WTO is, one needs to understand that even if there are various agreements that have been entered into under the uh, framework of WTO, there are certain basic inherent rules of WTO law, which is uh, which are important to understand as a student of international trade, uh, because that establishes sort of uh, your basis of understanding of WTO law. And uh, uh, as you can see, there are five uh, bulletin points here. The first four rules deal with the substantive aspect of WTO law, whereas the last bit uh, deals with the um, uh, procedural uh, 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 procedural rules and institutional rules uh, um, that help in um, say implementing these uh, substantive laws. So the uh, first and foremost uh, rule of non-discrimination. Uh, rule of non-discrimination is uh, uh, one of the most important ones and it, is, it, it further is based on two rules of non-discrimination. Uh, firstly is the most favored nation treatment obligation and secondly national treatment obligation um so uh, most favored nation uh, treatment obligation or uh, popularly known as mfn treatment what does it mean it essentially requires a wto member uh, that grants a favorable treatment to a country uh, to give the same favorable treatment to all other wto members uh, so as the name uh, aptly suggests, it's, it's a non-discrimination treatment. Therefore, it ensures that uh, a WTO member does not discriminate between its trading partners. Uh, there are, of course, exceptions to this as well, and they need to be studied uh, in their own light uh, separately. But this is the general principle. Uh, secondly, coming to the national treatment. Uh, national treatment obligation requires the WTO member to treat uh, foreign products, services, and uh, service suppliers, to treat them no, uh, no less favorably than it treats the like products, services, or service suppliers um, uh, that its own, like the, 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 the national players. Um, so these two basic principles combined are are, form the basis of uh, rules of non-discrimination. Whereas in trade in goods, it's a general obligation. As far as trade and services is concerned, there are specific commitments that are made by uh, the members. So uh, this is the first rule, that is the rule of non-discrimination, uh, under which there is MFN treatment obligation and there is national treatment obligation. Uh, moving to the second rule, uh, that is the rule of market access. Uh, rules on market access are uh, very broad. It's difficult to cover it in detail at the moment, but I would like to categorize it under four different groups of rules, um, starting with uh, customs duties or, you know, known as tariffs. Then there are other uh, duties and financial charges, 
quantitative restrictions like quotas and then there are non tariff barriers uh, which also which is a broad category uh, that also includes uh, sps and tbt uh, which i will come to a bit later um uh, what i would like to stress upon uh, while we discuss rules on market access is that there is a, a there is a larger uh, misconception amongst people that wto prohibits uh, imposition of customs duties which is absolutely not true because customs duties are uh, legitimate policy instruments however what wto does is that it 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 encourages the members to negotiate mutually in reduction of these customs duties so uh, this forms the second rule uh, on market access um thirdly i would like to move to rules on unfair trade uh as far as unfair trade rules are concerned at present there are no general rules on the same uh, however there are detailed rules regarding uh, certain forms of unfair trades such as dumping and subsidies um uh, dumping uh, had had become uh, was uh, is is uh, i mean if you read the newspapers you would have uh, come across certain uh, articles about anti dumping measures etc so so what essentially is uh, dumping all about it 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 basically means that um, um an ex uh, a, a country exporting a product not a country but like uh, exporting of a product to another market at a price less than the normal value um uh it's not prohibited per se but rather when uh this kind of a dumping causes or threatens to cause material injury uh, to domestic in, uh, to, to to the domestic industry of a member um producing a like product then such a member has uh, can rather impose anti dumping duties on the dumped products to sort of offset the effect of dumping um further as i mentioned uh, another uh, unfair uh, form of unfair trade is is subsidies uh, as far as subsidies are concerned uh, uh, export and import substitution subsidies are prohibited uh, and then there are other subsidies that are not prohibited per se but when they have adverse effect um, countermeasures commensurate with adverse effect uh, may be authorized uh so that brings me to the end of the third rule that is the rules on unfair trade um lastly uh, on the substantive part or or other substantive rules of wto law is the rules are the rules on conflict between trade liberalization and other societal values and interests um at the cost of repetition i have added this again because uh, it's it's very important rule to understand um uh, so basically what this means is that wto law also addresses conflict between trade liberalization and various other social societal and value uh, values and interests um uh, and that can be achieved through what are known as the exceptions wto members are uh, allowed to deviate from uh, the wto rules under specific condition and uh, uh, there are various such factors you know that that, that include uh, again public health environment uh national security public morals etc uh you can find the specific rules with uh, with respect to exceptions under articles 20 and 21 in gat and article 6 uh, article 14 and 14b under gats uh so as 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 uh, to uh, to recapitulate uh, to uh, to recap uh, there are four substantive rules of w uh, wto law rules on non discrimination market access unfair trade and conflict between trade liberalization and other societal values and interests and lastly uh, there are institutional procedural rules as far as decision making trade policy review is concerned and of course most importantly the rules with, with, with respect to dispute settlement on how dispute settlement uh, happens and how how does wto uh, ensure monitoring uh, the implementation of all the substantive rules of the wto law this may um, sound a bit complicated and complex and overwhelming but uh, but as you start reading every uh, uh, every specific agreement the understanding becomes much clearer but having the base of these basic rules or understanding these basic rules helps uh, in sort of 
uh, understanding the framework uh, at large um the next question obviously that follows after this is where do where do i find these rules and what are what are the sources of uh, wto law so uh, we will cover it in the next slide thank you um so in the next slide as you can see uh, i have sort of uh, tried to color co code it um uh, the dark blue represents the principal sources of uh, wto law whereas the other sources of uh, wto law are uh, appearing in the lighter shade of blue uh the first and foremost and the most important one to understand is the marrakesh agreement establishing the wto along with its annexes um uh, these are multilateral trade agreements what do i mean by that so uh the the marrakesh agreement if you see is like a very short uh, basic agreement which includes uh, 16 articles um and there are a host of other uh, agreements that are uh, included in uh, annexes 1 2 and 3 which are said to form an integral part of the agreement therefore wt uh, in uh, as far as wto law is concerned um marrakesh agreement plus annex 1 2 and 3 are considered to be a single undertaking uh, except for annex 4 which consists of plurilateral agreements all the multilateral wto agreements apply equally and are equally binding on all wto members so what are the contents of these annexes uh, annex 1 is uh, further divided in three parts that is annex 1a 1b and 1c um, annex 1A covers uh, uh, agreements in goods. Uh, GATT 1994 is uh, a part of Annex 1A. Um, secondly, there is Annex 1B, which includes general agreement on trade and services, or uh, popularly known as GATS. And lastly, in 1C, uh, there's an agreement uh, uh, on trade-related aspects of um, uh, on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. Uh, or that, which is known as ships agreement which forms uh, a part of uh, uh, annex 1c so annex uh, um, uh, annex 1 as you can see more or less covers the principal substantive law as we had discussed earlier uh, um, the the basic rules uh, you will find in these annexes moving on to annex 2 uh, it's it's a very important one, especially for uh, lawyers to understand is because it includes or consists of understanding on rules and procedures for settlement of disputes uh, or popularly known as the DSU, that is dispute settlement uh, understanding. And um, uh, it applies to all disputes arising under the WTO agreements. Um, it's, uh, it's important to know that it sets out a compulsory jurisdiction for all the disputes arising out of WTO agreements. Uh, then uh, followed by Annex 3, which includes trade policy review mechanism, which I will not uh, uh, discuss more in detail, uh, but it's important to know. And um, then lastly, uh, the, the second bulletin point, as you can see, the plurilateral agreements. Uh, they are plurilateral because, of course, not, uh, WTO, not all the WTO members are uh, party to it. Um, and there are two such agreements. There's agreement on civil aircrafts and agreement on government procurement. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very, of course, it's, uh, agreement on government procurement is also very interesting to look at. Uh, and I would encourage you to uh, read up more on it. Um, and um, yeah, and then um, that, uh, the, next, uh, uh, the next source of WTO law um, is the protocol of accession protocols on, uh, of accession these are not uh, discussed so much in detail because of course these apply to the new members of wto that have adopted the protocols of accession and they are said to also form an integral part of the wto agreement uh, this was specifically relevant in say case of uh, in the in, in the case of uh, chinese uh, accession uh, uh, protocol accession uh, in china rare earths case so the, these issues have uh, come up in uh, disputes before as well and finally uh, in in terms of the principal sources of wto law we have ministerial decisions and declarations uh, 
uh, there are about 27 of them uh, which which form the final act adopted in marrakesh however uh, it's important to note that they do not generate uh, specific rights or obligations uh, for the wto members therefore they cannot be uh, uh, enforced through wto dispute settlement um so if we consider the top four these are the principal sources of wto law and the rest are of course the other sources of wto law uh, i will probably not get into each of them individually but uh, there are but these other sources of course are do not have a same legal footing as the wto agreements uh, they do not themselves provide for any specific enforceable rights or obligations however they may uh, aid in clarifying or defining um the law that applies to wto members so um uh, it's um it it definitely provides an aid to uh, during various dispute settlement um having discussed the sources of wto law i would more or less conclude um uh, the the first part of the presentation and that is understanding uh, the wto framework uh, to recap what we have discussed so far is what is trade why does it need to be regulated what is wto uh, what are the basic rules of wto and what are the sources of wto law uh, as we can as 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 you all can tell that uh, international trade is a topic that has various implications on different aspects uh, of businesses and uh, um and it's and one such uh, trade linkage or, or one such uh, related or uh, 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 link topic to international trade is of course environment how how the question is how does one ensure that uh, the development of international trade happens hand in hand with um uh, protection of uh, our environment and sustainable development uh, how do we ensure that despite the uh, uh, despite the um, development and growth we leave this planet uh, a better place for our future generations to come and um wto uh, has also played a part in this um uh and in the next slide uh, i would like to sort of uh, briefly touch upon these linkages so uh trade and environment and what does w uh, and does wto law address issues relating to protection and preservation of the environment um if i want to keep it short the answer would be yes definitely wto does address various environmental issues uh, um, that are linked to international trade uh, the most fundamental source of or other evidence uh, to this is the preamble of marrakesh agreement uh, and uh, for the benefit of uh, all of us i would like to just quote it if if uh, if you allow um it it states that the parties to this agreement recognizing that their relations in the field of trade and economic endeavor should be conducted with a view to raising standards of living ensuring full employment and a large and steadily growing volume of real income and effective demand and expanding the production of and trade in goods and services while allowing for the optimal use of the world's resources in accordance with objective of sustainable development seeking both to protect and preserve the environment and to enhance the means for doing so in a manner consistent with their respective needs and concerns at different levels of economic development and then the preamble goes further but uh, i thought it's important to point it out because uh, as as we understand the importance of uh, preamble in uh, in international agreements and and the sort of tone they set for uh, what is to follow in the agreement uh we can uh, we can definitely say that uh environmental considerations or protection and preservation of environment has been consciously taken into has been consciously taken into consideration while setting out rules for wto or other uh, rules under the wto framework uh wto seeks to uh, to 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 encourage the optimal use of world's uh, resources in accordance with objective of sustainable development and seeking to protect and preserve the environment which are fundamental to the wto uh this 
does not happen in vacuum though it has to go hand in hand with the main objective of wto to reduce further trade barriers and uh, eliminates any kind of discriminatory treatment in international trade relations uh, so how can this balance be uh, met or how how can this balance uh, how can this balance be achieved and uh, one of the best examples uh, that i can um, share with you is through um, general exceptions under article 20 of the gatt uh, there are various disputes that have been brought to the panel and the appellate body um uh, which precisely discuss this 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 uh, uh this this topic this that touch upon this topic um article 20 on general exceptions uh, lay out a number of specific uh, instances in which wto members can be exempted from uh, gat rules and uh, two such uh, instances are important or rather relevant in this context uh, that is article 20b and article 20g uh which allow wto members to justify gat consistent measures if they are uh, gat inconsistent measures if they are necessary to protect human animal or uh, plant life or health or if the measures relate to conservation of exhaustible natural resources respectively um uh, of course this this does not is it's not a stand alone provision it has to be read along with the shapo condition under article 20 uh, which basically states that environmental measures may not be applied in a manner uh, which will constitute to uh, constitute a means of arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination between countries where the uh, same conditions prevail or a disguised restriction on uh, international trade um so these uh, uh, additional safeguards mainly uh, seek to ensure that uh, by allowing a mem- member to be inconsistent with gat rules uh, through these through, through the use of these exceptions protectionism is not encouraged uh, through the back door uh so as far as um, uh, what we've discussed so far the preamble uh, of marrakesh agreement and article 20 of gat uh finally there are uh, two more specialized agreements that i would like to uh, bring to your notice uh, firstly is that of uh, um, the tbt agreement or the agreement on technical barriers to trade now what is tbt agreement about uh, tbt agreement uh, recognizes wto members rights to implement measures to uh, achieve legitimate policy objectives uh such as protection of human health and safety or uh, protection of the environment um uh, the agreement also uh, strongly encourages uh, members to base their measures on international standards to sort of maintain um uh, harmonization and predictability uh one one interesting example of a tbt measure could be various labeling schemes uh and 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 you can uh, actually follow up on various disputes that have come to fore in this regard um uh finally uh, i would like to touch upon the sps agreement or which is also known as the uh, rather it's the agreement on application of uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures um this agreement sets out the basic rules for food safety and animal and plant health standards uh members are allowed to basically set their own rules uh, as long as they are based on some form of a scientific evidence um so uh these i would these i, I would say are uh, the legal provisions which have been used time after time uh, by various uh, wto members to ensure that they introduce uh, national legislation or national uh, policies in place to protect uh, their environment uh, or rather uh, animal plant and human life and safety um, without without uh, implementing a protectionist uh, measures and ensuring that this balance is uh, maintained um, of course apart from um, uh, these legal provisions specifically there are various committees at the wto who also engage in uh, constant discussions in terms of policy that helps uh, in uh, preserving and protecting the environment uh this pretty much uh, brings me to the end of uh, the presentation uh, 
uh, what uh, I, I I hope I have uh, um, uh, I hope I have um, established uh, the basic framework of WTO law and establish a relationship between WTO law and various environmental issues that are dealt uh, with under uh, this particular this larger framework. And of course, can I just uh, be like, can we go on the previous slide? Thank you. Um, no, the sources. Thanks. Um, uh, having said that, I encourage you to read up more, uh, understand various concepts relating to international trade regulation. I promise you it's a very, very interesting and an upcoming uh, area of practice and area of law. Um, and even if you are not uh, maybe interested to practice uh, in this particular area, uh, it's of course, it's, it's, it's so well connected to our day to day life that uh, it, it, it's, it, it would be an interesting read for sure. I highly recommend uh, uh, you get uh, your hands on this one particular commentary that I extensively referred to during my uh, course on uh, mas uh, during my master's program and even today. Um, and of course, there are many reading materials out there. This is not a marketing uh, tool or anything, but I would just like to tell you from my personal experience that it's helped me a lot. And uh, apart from that, of course, there's a, like this plethora of information available on the WTO website itself. I do encourage you to uh, read up uh, more and understand this better. And I will be more than happy to um, engage with you in future uh, with respect to any questions you may have or rather any interesting research topics that you're working on. Uh, as I say that uh, I'm not just a professional in this area, but I am, I'm, I'll always be a student of international trade uh, and investment law and I would love to engage with you. So um, I don't know, I think, yeah, I think we are on time. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, spend last 15 minutes because I, I was told that there are a lot of uh, penultimate year students and final year students uh, who would be participating. Uh, and I understand that you might have various questions regarding uh, pursuing masters uh, in international uh, law, but more specifically in international trade law. Uh, and perhaps I can share my experience with you, answer any spe specific questions that you may have. Um, and uh, yes. Uh, I think that's great. The chat box is now enabled. So I request you to uh, leave any questions that you may have and I will answer those now. Thank you. Also, I see that a lot of uh, people have left their email addresses um i think it's it's great to uh, network and get in touch with people who share uh, the interest on this subject um okay i see there are many people asking if we get certificate for this webinar i guess not but i i will leave spill to answer this question I'd rather not say about anything about it. Hello, Devi Singh. I guess we'll give it two more minutes or maybe I can just share my experience of um, pursuing masters in international law and economics. Um, what are the type of internships that students should opt for doing masters in international trade? What are the career opportunities in international trade law? How do we get into international trade degree outside India? Okay, so let me take this these questions up one by one. What would be the impact of USA withdrawing from the WTO? Uh-huh, okay. That's a very good question, Amisha. Uh, all right, so I will start with um, type of internships uh, for doing masters in international trade law. Um, uh, I would like to give a disclaimer that all of uh, the things that I would say now are in my humble opinion, 
and uh, it's not there there is no specific rule on how to go about uh, doing things uh, everyone has a different journey but um, uh, i honestly believe that um, it's such a uh, large field or area of both law as well as policy uh, it's important to understand uh, what you want to pursue or other what are your ambitions uh in the in the in the say next 4 or 5 years and it's important to cater uh, or rather um, tailor make your journey uh in a way that it benefits you uh in your larger ambitions in life uh as far as internships are concerned of course uh, if if you are talking about internships in india uh, there are various law firms that deal with um uh, uh the international trade issues as well as uh uh what are your tips okay uh yes yeah, so there are various uh, uh i would say that there are various law firms uh, within india as well that have a specialized uh, practice in trade and international trade uh, i would recommend that uh, getting an internship at one of these firms will perhaps uh, help you in gaining experience and understanding what your life may look like after you are uh, 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 after you are uh, graduate and what what kind of uh, work does a, a trade lawyer is expected to do uh, having said that there are plenty of other opportunities available even at uh, say think tanks there are many think tanks in india that do great research work in the uh, area of uh, trade and trade law as well as policy uh, there are international organizations that you can apply for unfortunately given the in, like the the covid crisis and the situation perhaps uh um there aren't too many opportunities available uh, in international organizations but i'm sure uh, if you keep uh, looking up perhaps there will be some uh, uh, opportunities opening up uh, remotely that you can pursue um so i guess this answers your question on uh, internship opportunities i think uh, hashni thank you for the question on uh, career opportunities i would say it's the same it depends on uh, what kind of career are you planning to build for yourself uh, do you want to uh, restrict yourself to um, trade law dispute related practice or advisory practice or do you want to expand in the academic uh, field uh, and engage more in research activities or policy there's there's tons of opportunities out there it depends on wh- where your interests lie um what are your tips on students wanting to do john h jackson moot uh oh wow uh yeah i mean uh the tips that i i mean i i would like to uh, the the tips that i would like to give is that be very thorough with your basic readings um understand the uh, understand the law very well go through the reports um and practice 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 engage with many people like as many people as you can um uh, this year's glc team big congratulations to the girls uh, they were extremely hard working and uh, uh, i saw how hard they were trying to get in touch with professionals who could help them and train them to participate in the moot so i i i think that would be uh, the only advice i would give but if uh, uh, alessandra shroff if you happen to participate uh next year uh, i would be happy to um uh, help you in any way i can uh and i would encourage you to reach out to me i will be more than happy to do that um what one can do if he wants to do his perfect in mood okay uh don't take so much pressure no one is perfect i i think it's uh, the whole idea of moot courts is that uh, you can reflect on uh, the skills that you have and to polish them in each round uh, and effectively you know uh, improve on the feedback that you receive so don't 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 be so worried about being perfect uh, it's it's a learning process it's not just about winning i guess there is need for any other degree or diploma for practice of wto law uh, i mean i i i guess uh, not um, since we don't 
since we don't have trade law as subject um okay sorry i, I before moving on to the uh, next question uh, i would quickly answer are there any other degree or diploma practice to uh, in wto law i am not 100% sure on all the courses available in india or abroad that you can pursue may, maybe remotely or in person uh, but um uh, you know it definitely helps right if you if you uh, if you have any kind of a certification or specific training that you go through in an area of law it always turns out to be an advantage in terms of uh, your own understanding and what uh, when like when employer seeks uh, certain skills in people that they want to hire uh, for that uh, for that specific area of law so yes definitely it helps if you have a degree or diploma in the related uh, fields um since we do not have trade law as subject how would you suggest self studying these agreements thank you that's a great question urshila i would um, i i think one of the best approaches would be uh, to uh, perhaps get i mean i understand that uh, uh, getting resources and having that kind of a, uh, an in infrastructure is probably not available especially there are certain challenges in glc that i am aware of uh it might be difficult to get uh, hands on uh, uh books so i would say that wto website itself has a lot of information available uh, all the reports uh, uh panel as well as appellate body reports are available uh, uh on the public domain so you do not need access to any specific uh database or tool to get access to that um definitely reading a commentary helps in understanding or interpreting the law better it kind of de develops a discipline uh, to interpret uh, these regulations and understand the framework of international trade regulation if you're specifically interested i can try and um, recommend certain uh, uh, um, commentaries apart from the one that i mentioned before to you and uh, just write to me and let's figure out some way that you can get access to uh, this material um what landmark judgments would you recommend to someone trying to get started with trade law um uh, ashwini uh, i i would just like to say that um the the it, it's a the issue of uh precedence is a bit controversial uh, as far as trade law is concerned because every case has to be uh, um there is no uh, there is no explicit principle of stare decisis right as i have mentioned before uh, reports form the other sources of uh, in of uh, uh, wto law which sort of aid in interpretation and ensuring predictability of course but uh, definitely you know uh, it's hard to say that read a particular specific uh, um a specific report but if you can see my slide on sources and references i have given one particular i have mentioned one particular link uh, of the wto which which sort of enlists all the um uh, disputes in which uh, there were linkages to environmental issues so perhaps you can refer to that particular link and identify the cases therein and that could be a good start to have an understanding on these linkages but this is only specifically of course uh, with respect to environmental issues uh, as uh, i mean if you have any specific interests you will for the you can for the you know uh, develop on that and start reading some other reports what kind of methods or studies make our memorial interesting uh, okay i think this is again a very moot related uh, question i i mean i don't uh, i i don't think there is one particular way of drafting your memorial but uh, of course being uh, precise uh, uh, ex very to the point um and not extremely verbose uh, putting your point across giving right references uh, gets you good points i guess how do we learn wto is there any website for documentation knowledge of import export wto related uh certificate can 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 i request someone from spill to please finally answer the question on the certificate for this webinar um because i think there are tons of people asking the same question again okay 
i think these are more or less the questions that i can see what uh, okay i'm sorry to disappoint you guys there will be no certificate provided for the webinar but i hope the session was interesting enough for you to have stayed for an hour um um and finally i guess um before concluding uh, no one asked me this question since trade and investment go hand in hand can you talk about the uh, investment aspect of course yes uh, um as as you may know there is uh, a trim there is an agreement called trims which also um which also addresses the investment aspects in trade um uh, having said that international economic law is a larger branch of or rather larger area of law which also in, in includes uh, investment issues um as far as the course that i uh, i did on masters in international law and uh, economics um we had a mandatory course in international investment law as well uh as you read both uh, the topics together you you realize that at the core of it there are many um commonalities even though they are uh, they are considered to be different practices of law um okay thank you um uh some good universities for pursuing international trade law i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily uh, list specific universities because you know it would be it would be unfair i cannot speak for the universities that i have not been to but uh, i can uh, i mean i have had a great experience at the world trade institute um uh, and um i i feel like the course gave me a holistic po perspective on international trade at large uh, and also of course international investment law um uh, which opened up a bunch of opportunities for me honestly and um i mean by opportunities i do not necessarily mean job opportunities but rather uh, it opened up different avenues of uh, um law that um uh i could i could pursue uh, potentially um having said that i think to conclude i would just like to encourage this group because i think all of you are law students i would highly encourage you to uh, also read a little bit of uh, literature on the economics of international trade because if you uh, if you do want to um, understand international uh, trade law it's important to understand the economic principles behind it and when you do that it it makes i think it makes you a better lawyer or a better academic or uh, uh, whatever you aspire to be but um yeah so i highly encourage you to uh, get your hands on legal literature as well as economic literature if you are interested in the area of international trade regulation and having said that i think i would like to conclude uh, ashwini do you want to take over i think uh, i don't know if it's just me but I, your voice is lagging a little i think it's my internet connection i'm sorry okay uh, can you hear me now yeah yes it's perfect thank thank you so much for sparing your time for uh, holding this webinar it was a very very educating and knowledgeable session and yeah it was definitely not boring <laughs> so yeah so let's i hope i hope you pick it up as a subject that interests you and i think that yes, would be the sure. success of this session <laughs> yes i think uh, we can stop now thank you so much okay so that's great right. thank you and take care all of you uh, i hope you all uh, good health uh, bye everyone have a nice evening